right, amen. If you would please be seated, get your Bibles and open them up to Galatians chapter 1. I don't know if you knew it or not, but on the song during the offering, we had Bud singing as well. So Bud made his uh, debut there singing the harmonies. I want to welcome all of you that are joining us right now via our live stream or watching this after the fact. We appreciate you tuning in and joining us here this morning at Grace Life Bible Church. And uh, hopefully you are blessed and encouraged for having done so. Mark, if we could bring up the tablet quick, I want to do what I tried to do last Sunday, and this is for the benefit of those of you that are at home right now and are watching the live stream. We are having a Bible conference at the church. If you go to gracelifebiblechurch.com, this is the the website, and right up here in the upper right-hand corner is an announcement that says 2022 West Michigan Grace Bible Conference. And if you click on that, it will load a page that gives all of the details for our Bible conference. So again, if you are joining us in the live stream, we are having this meeting October 21 through the 23rd. It is here at Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. There's a video announcement there. Uh, Our theme is the weapons of our warfare, understanding the nature of our spiritual warfare. The speakers are Reed, Reeser, and Ross. And we will, the the full uh, schedule is all here on the website for you to consider. So you guys can uh, bring that down and we can move on. But we'd love to have you come and be a part of the conference here at Grace Life Bible Church in October. Uh, it's, it's always uh, hopefully a good time and encouragement and so forth in the Word of God. I know that the, 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 the folks here are definitely looking forward to that. So I want to continue with our series of studies in the book of Galatians. And last Sunday we looked at verse 3 where it says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We studied that, we talked about understanding God's attitude toward the world today, and we looked at the issue of grace and peace, and we talked about how that is not just simply Paul's formulaic greeting, what he says at the beginning of every epistle, but there's a whole lot more wrapped up into that statement about grace and peace, and we looked at those things last Sunday, and this morning what I want to do is move on now into looking at verse 4, but before we do that, let's read verses 1 through 5 and have a word of prayer. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you in peace, from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according as he hath chosen, sorry, what, I don't know what I'm reading, I'm thinking Ephesians now, sorry, uh, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We just pray that it will be encouraging and edifying for those who have tuned in or have come out to be a part of the, uh, the service this morning. We pray that they'll be encouraged. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, one of the things I haven't said yet, but if uh, it's occurring to me as I'm reading it, is verses 1 through 5 are one sentence. The sentence starts at verse 1, and it doesn't end until you get to, to verse 5. And so there's this thought here that Paul is using now to introduce the epistle and to address Uh, the churches of Galatia, and we've spent a lot of time breaking down the component parts of this statement as we've got the ball rolling here on this particular series of studies, and we find ourselves this morning right there at the beginning of verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So I'm not going to repeat a lot of what I've already said because I want to make progress through this, and there's a lot to say about this morning's verse as well. Let's talk about that first phrase there in verse 4 where it says, who gave himself for our sins. The first thing I want to say to you about that is that there's an antecedent to that, and the antecedent is verse 3. So who, let me say it this way, who is the who in verse 4 who gave himself for our sins? Who is the who that that's speaking about? Well, that's Jesus Christ. How do you know? Go to the previous verse. Verse 3, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from who? Our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself. So the phrase, who gave himself for our sins, is a continuing of the thought about Jesus, about our Lord Jesus Christ from the end of verse 3, who gave himself for our sins. So the antecedent to that statement is at the end of verse 3, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins in verse 4, okay? Now, you probably didn't need me to tell you that. You probably could figure that out on your own, and I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but I do want you to see that when you study your Bible, what's said in verse 4 is based on what's said where? In verse 3, right? And so there's a continuing idea going on here that Paul is uh, still sort of hashing out or discussing, okay? 
So look at, the, look at verse 4 again. Who gave himself for our sins. So simply stated, the Lord Jesus Christ willingly gave up his own life to pay for our sins. That's what the verse says. Who gave himself for our sins. So who made the choice? He did. He made the choice for himself. It was his choice. He gave himself. He willingly did it. He did it of his own volition, of his own accord. He was willing to die in our stead, in our behalf, for our what? For our sins, right? Who gave himself for our sins. Now, there's a lot of verses that we can look at on this. Make sure you mark Galatians 1 and come back with me to Romans 4. Come back with me to Romans chapter 4. In my midweek videos, hopefully you folks are following those when I post them from my office. I try to do one a week. Most weeks I accomplish that. Sometimes I get busy and I don't, I don't have time to do it. But hopefully you're following those. The last three that I've done have been in a series that I've called uh, Why Grammar Matters. And we've been looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19, 20, and 21 in this little mini-series that I've been doing at home from my office and I've been very specific about understanding. We talk about the finished work of Christ. We talk about the complete work of Jesus Christ. We, when we do, though, we're referring to some very particular things, to some very specific things. Look at uh, Romans 4, look at verse 25. Notice, who was delivered. Make a mental note of the word delivered. It's going to come up again here in a little bit who was delivered for our offenses. And again, who was delivered, verse 24 tells us, uh, but, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses. The Lord Jesus Christ was delivered to the cross for our offenses. It was on the cross that he died and paid for sin, that he made satisfaction for sin. It is on the cross, there are those seven sayings that Christ utters while he is hanging on the cross, and one of them is, my God, my God, why have you what? Forsaken me, right? Because Jesus Christ, while he hangs there on the cross, does he have the sin of the world poured out upon him? Okay, And does he suffer the full wrath of God against sin as he hangs there on the cross? So he becomes so identified with your sin and my sin and our sin that the father can no longer look upon his own son. And he says, my God, my God, why have you what? Forsaken me. He is delivered for our offenses. It is at the cross that he died and suffered and made satisfaction and satisfied the offended justice of God against sin, where he paid for sin. So he's delivered to the cross for our offenses. Why am I stressing that? Because the verse we're looking at says, Who gave himself for our what? Sins. He didn't just do it because it was fun. He didn't just do it because it sounded like a good idea. No, he did it for a particular reason. He did it for our sin. In that moment there on the cross, does he pay for sin? Yes, okay? Now look at uh, verse Romans 4, verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses, but look at what the, the second half of the verse says. It was raised again for our what? For our justification. See, you have to have the finished work of Christ. You have to have the complete work. You have the death for sin. He was delivered for our offenses. But then you have the resurrection where he's raised for our what? For our justification. You have to have all three of those. That is the finished, the total, the complete work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's delivered to the cross for our offenses. And he's raised again for our justification. So come with me to 1 Corinthians 15. That's why when we see, that's why when we quote 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 4, it's so important that we pay attention to what we're actually saying here, okay? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 4. Here is, again, notice the word delivered. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So Paul is delivering to the um, he is delivering to them the message that he received. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Well, what was it? How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Watch. And that he was buried. Now, why is that important? He's buried to prove that he what? That he died. 
He's buried to prove that he died, right? Do you understand that the Muslims today, that the Islamic world does not believe, that they believe that somebody else died on the cross, but it wasn't really Jesus, okay? That's what they believe. That's what they teach. Uh, if you study Islamic thought and doctrine, that's what they're saying. So he was, uh, uh, verse 3, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, verse 4, and that he was buried... And then we have, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You have to have all three of those. You have to have the death, the burial, and the what? And the resurrection. That is the finished work of Christ because he's delivered for our offenses and he's raised again for our justification. Okay? There's a, there's a lot involved in that. Come over to 2 Corinthians 5. I just made mention about this a moment ago. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is the verse I just did my midweek message on. I posted it just a couple days ago on Thursday about the issue of the heiress. Ten so the, the series is Why Grammar Matters, and I'm inten intentionally focusing on the specifics and the particulars of the grammar. We talked about this verse. Look at verse 21. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us. Okay, now notice, notice. Go back to verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us. So did God the Father make God the Son to be sin for us? Now, had God the, Father, had God the Son sinned, was he deserving of the death that was on the, his death on the cross? Did he deserve it? No, but does he give himself over to it? Okay, that's the idea that we're looking at here, right? For he hath made him to be sin for us. So at a point in time in the past, did God the Father make Christ to be sin for us? He died there for our sin. That's the verse we're looking at in Galatians chapter 5. Just Hopefully you marked it, just flip back there. Who gave himself for our sins. You need to see that this is something that Christ did of his own accord, working in conjunction with the will of God the Father so that satisfaction for, for sin could be made, right? And so in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us, no, notice, who knew no what? Who knew no sin. So Jesus Christ never sinned. He was the spotless, blameless uh, Lamb of God, right? And he dies on the cross, and does he have the sin of the world put upon him there? And is he, as it were, made sin who knew no what? Sin. Verse 21. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see the word might? Does that mean that it's possibility? Does there's the potentiality to be made the righteousness of God in him? But it's not automatic. You're not automatically made the righteousness of God in him. Why? Because you as an individual person, do you have to submit to the preaching of the gospel? Do you have to agree with God about your sin and the fact that he was made sin for you and when he was made sin for you and he died on the cross for your sin and you by faith reach out to Redeemer who died in your stead and in your place and now does he give you eternal life as a free gift and give you the forgiveness of sins? You understand what I'm saying here, right? So notice the potentiality there that we might be made the righteous of God in him. The word might, this, the, the verb there that is translated might be made is in grammar what we call subjunctive, which means it's determined by the conditions. There's something about it that is yet undecided and undetermined. So at a point in time, understand that verse, in the point in time in the past, did God the Father make Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin? What's a, That we might be made what? the righteousness of God in him. It's not a done deal, and it's not automatic until you trust that Christ died for you. You follow that, hopefully. Come over to 1 Peter real quick. Come over to 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> now, I'm staying away right now from talking about some of the controversies about some of these verses because we just don't need to get off into the weeds. The verses are clear. Did Jesus Christ die on the cross and pay for all sin? Yes. When are you forgiven? You are forgiven when you believe and trust what he did for you. 
Faith is not a work, belief is not a work, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for what? For righteousness, right? So we understand that at the cross did Jesus Christ pay for all sin. Yes, he satisfied the offended justice of God against sin so that he can now take and offer the world eternal life as a free gift. A free gift that you receive by faith, by grace through faith, in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Notice, who his own self. It wasn't somebody else. It was who? It was Christ. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. The point I want you to see there is who's making the choice and who's bearing his our sin and who is taking that upon himself in his own body by on the tree. And when he is on the tree, cursed is he, cursed is every man that hangeth on a what? tree, the scripture says, right? And it is there that he has made sin for you. He's made sin for me. He has made sin for us there. And he bears it in his own body. And in that moment, does he die? Is the sacrifice made? Think about the Old Testament, right? How many times, year after year, read the book of Hebrews, year after year, did they bring the blood of bulls and goats and did they kill a sacrifice to, to cover the sin? But it never, it never satisfied the offended justice of God against sin. So here comes the Lord Jesus Christ in his own body on a tree and he dies there on that tree and he's identified with our sin. He has made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made what? The righteous of God. And he is doing it for, it is his choice. He is choosing it for himself, of himself, in operating in conjunction with the will of the Father. Go to Ephesians 5. Come over to Ephesians chapter 5. Folks, you are not born into this world, into a state of automatic forgiveness, okay? You're just not. You are born into this world as part of the course of this world. You are born into this world as a sinner with the wrath of God abiding upon you, right? And if you die in an unregenerate state, do you have eternal punishment to look forward to? Okay? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And walk in love, watch, as Christ also hath loved us. Now watch. And hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling what? So Christ is giving of himself, okay? Um, the, Christ is giving himself, and it is the only offering that God the Father will accept to satisfy the offended justice of God against sin. Notice the phrase at the end of the verse. It says, notice it carefully, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. So why did he die for you? He died for you because he loved you. Okay? And hath given himself, here, and given himself. He's doing it. He's choosing and given himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God. Does he lay down his own life? Yes. And he does it as a sacrifice to God. And notice the end of the verse, for a sweet-smelling what? Savor. Come with me back to Leviticus chapter 1. Come back with me to Leviticus chapter 1. That phrase, a sweet-smelling savor, that phrase shows up when God talks to Israel about their sacrificial system back in time past. Jesus Christ gave himself as an offering, as a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. Look at Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 9. Now he gets into the details here of the sacrifice and how to do it and how the burnt offering is going to be made, etc. Verse 9, but his inwards and his legs shall be washed in water, 
And the priest shall burn on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, notice, of a sweet savor unto who? The Lord. So that, that offering there that's going to be offered, that burnt sacrifice, that burnt offering, is going to be a sweet savor to the Lord according to verse uh, 9. Look at verse 13. But he shall wash the inwards and the legs with water, and the priest shall bring it and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, of a sweet savor unto who? Unto the Lord. Look at verse 17. And he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, and shall not divide it asunder, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar and upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto who? Unto the Lord. Come back with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Come back with me to Ephesians chapter 5. What does Paul say? See, Paul takes that thing there from the Old Testament, and does he make the ultimate application of it to the Lord Jesus Christ? The Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice was the ultimate sweet-smelling savor unto the Father that satisfied his offended justice of God against sin. Ephesians 5, verse 2, Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for an offering. The passages we just read in Leviticus were specifically talking about Israel making burnt what? offerings, and the savor unto the Lord, etc. There's a lot more we could have looked at, but we're not for the sake of time. And hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. He laid down his own life to the Father as a sacrifice to God, notice, for a sweet-smelling what? Savor. Think about all the animals the blood of bulls and goats that were sacrificed all through time past, all through Israel's system, and they all are pointing in in type, shadow, and figure to who? To Christ. Christ Christ comes, he goes to the cross, he gives himself over for our sin, he is made sin for us who knew no sin, and as he hangs there on that cross, does he satisfy the offended justice of God? Is he an offering unto God the Father for the sin of the world, and is he considered, does God the Father consider it a sweet-smelling what? Savor. It is done, it is finished at that point. Come back to Galatians chapter 1. Come back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Who gave himself. So Christ gave himself. And notice the past tense. Did he, he did it in the past. Who gave himself for what reason? For our what? Sins. He did it for our sin to satisfy the justice of God against sin and be a sweet-smelling savor unto the Father. So the first step, folks, in re- the first step in salvation is recognizing the fact that you're a sinner and that you can't save yourself. Listen, as a sinner, it doesn't matter how much I go to church and how much I give to charity or how much money I put in the offering plate or you know any of the things that I would do or somebody would tell me to do to make God happy with me. All of those things, even on my best day, are going to leave me short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and will come what? Short of the glory of God, right? So the first thing that you need to do, the first thing a man needs to do, is acknowledge the fact that they're a sinner and they fall fallen short of the glory of God, right? And as a sinner, you can't save yourself. You need to reach out in faith to a Redeemer who paid the price, did what was necessary for you, who's willing to give you eternal life as a free gift. Christ gave himself for our sins. Now watch, what's the next word in that verse? Who gave himself for our sins, what's the next word? That. You've heard me say it before, and I'll probably say it again, that that tells you the purpose and the intent of what he just said. Who gave himself for our sins, that. The reason that he might deliver us from this present evil what? World. So the word that tells us the purpose and the intent of what was just said. Why did Christ offer himself a ransom for sin? It's so that he might deliver us from something. There's a purpose behind it. So at a point in time in the past, did he of himself, notice the verse again, who gave, past tense, himself for our sins, that he might, there's the word might again, that he might deliver us from what? This present evil world. So let's talk about the word deliver. 
The word, the, 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 the word deliver, the, the, the Greek word that's translated deliver means to root out. To root out. To release. To rescue. So we're having some work done at our house this week. And they're working on a siding. And what kind of bush is that again? That plant we're trying to dig out? There's an azalea. It's like way, it's too close to the house and it's rubbing against the siding. Okay, so we were trying to root it out. We're trying to deliver it. Okay, we're trying to get it. We're trying to do what? Remove it, right? That's the idea of deliver. It means to root out, to release, to rescue, okay? The English verb deliver carries a host, a ton, there's a ton of different meanings. I'm not even going to put them all up on the board. You can go, you can look at them all on uh, Noah Webster's American Dictionary, the English language website. You can look at them there. But there's a bunch of different meanings of it. The word deliver, like you have here in this verse, occurs 296 times in 281 verses in your King James Bible. So the word deliver, 296 times in 281 verses, okay? Likewise, the word deliverance, deliverance, occurs 16 times in 15 verses. And lastly, the word delivered, past tense, is found 291 times in 287 verses. So you've got 296 occurrences of deliver, 16 of deliverance, and 291 occurrences of deliver. Do you think that the idea or the doctrine of deliverance is an important doctrine in your Bible? Now, I'm not going to run all, what is that, 500 plus references here on the word delivered, deliverance, and delivered for you. We're not going to do that. You can get in concordance, and, concordance and do that on your own time. But I want you to see that it is, an, it is an important doctrine in the Word of God. Why, look at the verse, who gave himself for our sins, that, the intent, the purpose, that he might what? Deliver us. So he gave, in the point in time in the past, he gave himself so that he might what? Deliver. Okay? I do want to look at one occurrence of this because I think it will help you with this. The word there that is translated deliver, come with me and look at, come over to Matthew 5 quick. Come over to Matthew 5. I want you to see this because it's very graphic and will help you understand what it means. So a good word picture here for you to understand this, this idea. I already told you that the word there, deliver, means to root out. Okay? Look with me at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll start here at verse 27. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. So this is right in the middle here of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 27. You have, you have heard that it is said by them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her in uh, ha, to, lo, to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already. Where, in his heart. Now watch. If thy right eye offend thee, do what? Pluck it out. The word "pluck it out." That phrase "pluck it out" is the same word that's delivered. So imagine reaching into your eye socket and yanking your eye out of your head. That's the idea of delivered. That's the idea of, of rooting out. That's the concept here that you need to get here, right? Christ gave himself for our sins that he might pluck us out, that he might deliver us, that he might root us out of this present evil world. Okay? He's not playing around. He's not messing around. He's giving of himself for our sin so that he can pluck us out, deliver us, root us out of this present evil world. That's what he's doing. Go over to Colossians chapter 1. Now here's the problem, right? I mean, I'll, I'll probably get to this more later, but that stupid Azalea did not want to come out. Didn't want to come out. We're working at that stupid thing. And, of course, then the, the, the guys that were doing the work, they're, they're coming down the, the front of the house, and they're getting closer and closer. And finally, we just sort of got some twine and 
you know, tied the thing back and got it away from the house so that they could get behind there because we weren't going to have enough time to get that out. That thing did not want to be rooted out. A lost man doesn't necessarily want to be rooted out of this present evil world. He has a will, and his will is, if he had his druthers, would he stay? But through the cross has God the Father, through the work of the Son, made a way for the, for, the, for the Son to reach in there and yank that guy out of this present evil world, to root him out, to pluck him out, to take him out of it. Notice the verse, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Who hath delivered, there's the word again, who hath delivered, pluck this out, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. See, when you're lost, are you under the power of darkness? You're under the power of darkness, and does the power of darkness want to keep you under its sway, under its authority, under its power, right? You're in darkness, and then the gospel is preached, and it shines a light of truth into your understanding, and you have the capacity in that moment to choose whether you're going to believe the gospel or not. And if you believe the gospel, will Jesus Christ reach into the darkness and deliver you out of that thing? He'll pluck you out of it. He'll root you out of it. Notice what it says. It delivered us from the power of darkness and it translated us into the kingdom of his dear what? You know, he took you out of the, the, he took you out of the crappy pasture and he put you in the paradise. That's what he did. He pulled you out of that. He pulled you out of the junk and the filth and the mire and the darkness and everything that was going on with you when you were in the world. And he translated you and put you over there into the kingdom of his dear son. But he died in the past who gave himself for our sins that he might do what? Deliver us. Go back to, go back to Galatians chapter 1. You know, God doesn't do anything against our will. This is why I'm not a Calvinist. God does not, against the will of the person, do anything to them that they do not want to be done to them. Are you following what I'm saying? And if you want to remain in darkness, and if you want to remain in the present evil world, and if you want to remain under the power uh, of darkness and under the authority of the adversary, is he willing to let, is he, is, is Christ going to override your free will and say, you're coming whether you want to or not, buster? No, he's not going to be, he's not going to be to us like I was with that azalea. Now the azalea won temporarily because I had a time constraint, but I'm coming back to that thing and it's going to be moved, okay? But I didn't have time to, I didn't have time to finish the work on that thing now, but look at the verse, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver, might deliver. We've talked about deliver, but he's saying he did it that he might deliver. It's important to note here again that the verb rendered might deliver in English is in the subjunctive mood. This is the mood of possibility or potentiality. Here's the definition that Oxford English Dictionary gives. In grammar it says, designating or relating to a verbal mood that offers to an action or state as conceived rather than as fact and is therefore used chiefly to express a wish, command, exhortation, or a contingent, hypothetical, or prospective event. He died for your sins so that ye might, what? Be delivered. Whose choice is it? So the, there's a contingency here. It's not automatic. The contingency lies with the will of the individual, whether they want to be delivered from this present evil one. So the subjunctive mood is apparent in English with the auxiliary helping verbs, such as, here's some examples, may, might, or should. I might take a nap today. Now, let's rephrase. I will take a nap today. I might mow the lawn. What does that mean? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. That's the idea here. Notice, who gave himself for our sins that we might, that he might do what? Has it all been paid for? Is he willing to do it? The only thing stopping somebody from being delivered from this present evil world is their own what? Their own will, their own choice. But you can note the subjunctive mood 
in English by looking and paying attention to these helping words, may, might, should, are used in conjunction with the main verb. So, might is the auxiliary, deliver is the main verb. So he, he gave, who gave himself for our sins that he might, maybe, potentially, possibly do what? It's not because he didn't do everything that was necessary, it's because I've got to do what? I've got to agree with God about the situation. I've got to, have, I've got to pl place my faith into the faith of Christ. So might is the auxiliary and deliver is the main verb. The deliverance provided for may or may not occur depending on the circumstances. Okay? But if it doesn't occur, it's not. It is not because Christ left something undone. If it doesn't occur, it is completely contingent on the individual person. So notice the structure now of the verse. Christ gave himself for our sins, right? In time, at a point in time in the past, that's why it says half. Christ, Christ verse 4, who gave himself for our sins. I don't know why I have half in the notes. I meant gave. The past tense is gave. Christ gave himself for our sins to make deliverance a possibility in the present. But deliverance in the present is contingent upon belief that Christ died for our sins. If you believe that Christ died for your sins and you receive that information as a free gift, does he deliver you from this present evil world? Does he grab you and does he uproot you? Does he pluck you out? Does he deliver you from under the power of darkness and put you in that fine pasture over yonder? You follow me? So Christ gave himself for our sins. Christ gave himself for the purpose. Here it is. Christ gave himself for the purpose of rooting and tearing us out of something. When he was there on the cross, and he's made sin for us who knew no sin, the darkness descend upon the situation. And out of the darkness does he cry, it is finished. Okay? So that he can today reach into the power of darkness through his cross work, through his resurrection, through his shed blood and resurrection from the dead, and take and deliver each and every one of us that wants to believe the gospel out from under that and put us somewhere else. Folks, I don't know. Like, listen. Football is going to start in like less than three weeks, and you're going to go home, and you're going to be all, all excited about the football game. This is way more exciting than that, okay? This is way more exciting than that. He gave himself for the purpose of rooting us, tearing us out of something. What, we're, what is it that he delivered us from? Let's go on. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil what? world. That tells you that anybody that is not delivered is part of this present evil what? World. To deliver us from this present evil world, the thing that Christ gave himself to tear us out of, to deliver us out of, to pluck us out of, is this present evil world. Let me ask you a question. Is there any doubt in your mind that we live in an evil world? There's no doubt in my mind. You look around, you see the news, you see what's going on, and it's very little is positive or good at all. Okay? You can look at the politics, the, the economics, you can look at all just all the different things that are going on in the world, the injustice, you can look at the... Um, the, 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 you know, the trafficking of humans, you can look at all, there's all sorts of things we could talk about, right? The corruption in the government, all these different things that we could, that we could look at, but he gave himself, there's a law in your Bible called the law of human collapse, and it teaches that things are not getting better and better, but that things are getting worse and what? Worse. Evil men and seducers shall wax what? Worse and worse, right? 
So when you look at the world, Paul wrote this in the first century, and he said in the first century when he wrote to the, the church of Galatia, he says, this present evil what? Was it true then? Is it true now? Yeah. So nothing's changed, right? Nothing has changed in the past 2,000 years in terms of the world. The world is still the world. The world is still charted after and following the course of this world, charted by the adversary. The world is the world, but he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present what? Evil world. Do you know what happens when you pull the azalea out eventually? You got a hole there, but is there still dirt on the roots of that azalea? Now, what, I mean, make an illustration here. When you get saved, he, he, you are totally a new creature in Christ, right? But that's spiritually speaking. Are you still in this earth suit until the day of redemption? So do you have all the dirt and bad thinking and habits and crud on you? Still, being in this earth suit that was in the dirt that had to be plucked out, and we so easily go back and think and function and operate out of that dirt and dirty thinking and so forth that we had from when we, that residual stuff that we had from when we were in the world. You understand what I'm saying, right? And so there's a picture here, not only of salvation and justification, but there's a picture here in my mind also of our sanctification in Christ. Paul says in in Ephesians, sorry, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be not conformed to the what? To the world. Well, why not? Because he delivered you what? Out of it. But is it easy for us to just go back to worldly thinking and functioning and operating now even though we're saved and we're no longer in the world? Are you guys following what I'm saying? Okay. Now go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, <coughs> so let's make sure we understand before we read this verse, who gave, if Galatians 1.4, who gave himself for our sins that he might do what? Deliver us from what? This present evil what? World. Why did you need to be delivered from this present evil world? Here's why. Chapter 2 verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of what? See, you came into the world with a default setting for the world. And you lived and walked and functioned and operated out of the world's system and out of the world's thinking and feeling and relating and and emoting, etc. Okay? But if you don't ever get out of the course of the world, if you never get out of this present evil world, and you, and you never reach out to faith to Christ who died for your sins so that you could be delivered out of it, and you die still in the world, do you have the wrath of God abiding upon you? Read the verse. Where in time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Is there a spiritual entity and force that is controlling and seeing to the course of the world? It's the prince, the power of the air. It's the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, right? So when Paul says in Colossians 1 verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, is he literally talking about being delivered out from under the power of the adversary? Okay, verse verse 3, among whom... So among the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of what? Wrath, even as others. So there's a course that the world's on, and it's being charted by who? The adversary, and it's the prince, the power of the air that is running it. That's why Paul says that you're delivered, Colossians 1.13, you're delivered from the power of what? 
darkness. So if you die in the world, are you under the wrath of God? The issue is you've got to get out of the world, and the only way to get out of the world is to be delivered from the world by somebody who paid the redemption price. And you need to be in him. And when you believe it, he literally reaches, I don't know how he does it, I'm just using an illustration, he grabs you by the hair and yanks you, plucks you, takes you, roots you out, and goes and puts you over there in the green pasture. You follow what I'm saying? Puts you into the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> Verse 3. Notice, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Lost. In whom, that's the lost, in whom the God of this what? World hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Folks, is Satan actively seeking to blind the mind of the lost? Yes. Is he seeking to keep them under his authority, under his jurisdiction, in his kingdom, so to speak? Okay? Believe not, uh, believe not less, so let me, let's start over verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should do what? See, what Satan is trying to do is he's, the God of this world is he's trying to keep these people in the dark, and he's trying to keep the gospel away from them because when the gospel is preached and the gospel is heard, it shines the light of truth into the darkness of their understanding. And does it give them the opportunity to believe? So the Satan actively opposing the gospel. Big time. So there's a course the world is on. It's charted by the adversary. Satan is the God of the world. He's the one seeking to blind people from understanding the light of the gospel. Go over to Matthew 4. In Matthew chapter 4, the Lord Jesus Christ is tempted of, of the devil. There's three different temptations recorded here. For the sake of time, we're going to go to verse 8. Matthew 5, verse 8, no, Matthew 4, verse 8, sorry, Matthew 4, verse 8, again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. So understand, the Satan take Christ into a high mountain and show him all the kingdoms of the earth, the world. Verse 9, and saith unto him, all these will I I give thee. Who said that? Satan said that. All these will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, No, 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 those aren't your kingdoms to give me. No. Then said Jesus unto him, get thee, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Notice, who possesses the kingdoms of the earth according to those verses? Satan. The Lord Jesus Christ does not dispute with him, does not say, no, those are my kingdoms. No, it is not a real temptation if Satan doesn't possess the authority over those what? over those kingdoms. Now, is there a day in the future when the Lord Jesus Christ will come in justice and righteousness and establish his kingdom? So what Satan is doing here is he's tempting Christ to do something that Christ will one day do, but at the wrong time. You following that? But who has the authority to offer him the kingdoms of the world? Because he's the, he's charted the course of this world. He is the God of this world. Go to Matthew 12. Matthew 12. See, 
the azalea's will was to stay where it was. Okay? And if it's unmessed with for the next thousand years, will it stay there? Barring tornado or some other thing, right? Okay? Is it the will of lost people to stay in the course of the world? To stay in this present evil world? Do they have any way to get out of it? Do they have, can, can the Isaiah say, you know, I think I'm going to uproot myself and go over there. No, the only hope the Azalea has to go over there is that somebody comes and does what? Delivers it. Picks it up, takes it up, and does what? Sets it over there. That's what we're talking about here. Okay? The God of the world wants to keep all the Azaleas where they are. And the Azaleas, as far as they know, through their deception, do they want to stay where they are? Are they good with it? They're great with it, right? And then some dumb Bible thumper comes along and gives them the gospel, and the azalea says, what? It's not good here. You mean I'm not a good azalea? No, you're a terrible azalea, and you need a redeemer. That's what you need. You following what I'm saying? Where I tell you to go? Matthew 12, verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his what? Does the Lord Jesus Christ believe that Satan is the God of this world and in control of the kingdoms of this world? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, God's willing to, God's willing to deliver every single one of those azaleas. Every one of them. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We talked about this a few months back, early, late spring, early summer. <coughs> for the mystery, Paul says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already what? Work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The mystery of iniquity is already at work during the dispensation of grace, and in fact it is the presence of the body of Christ that is withholding the full onset of the course of the world. If Satan had his druthers now, would he have unleashed his full mystery of iniquity and the full course of this world would it have happened already a long time ago? But it's been withheld. It has been restrained. The, there's a hinderer, there's a letter that has been put in the way, and that is the one new man, the church, the body of Christ. And when the church, the body of Christ is taken out of the way, will the pavement be set for the man of sin to, to uh, take the course of the world all the way to the full? Now, so we need to understand, folks, that Satan, Satan is currently controlling the systems of this world. His kingdom is not about truth and righteousness. It's based upon lies and sin. Okay? Satan will use any means possible to accomplish his sinister goals and aims. Folks, we, you know, we, I was having a, a, a meal with a, with a saint not too long ago, and this saint said to me, how long do you think the dispensation of grace is going to last? And I said, I don't know. From my vantage point of a human, when I look across what's going on in the world out there, I say, how much longer is God going to forbear with this situation? But he does. And he does it again and again and again. Why? Because God would have all men to be what? Does God want every single one of those azaleas to be plucked up and put in the other field? Yep, but they're not all going to be because their will is not to be. 
They think they're good. Now go back to Galatians 5, and I'll try to figure out how to end this. I keep talking about that because for me there's a, there's a powerful picture in what this deliverance is. This, this, this deliverance is literally an uprooting, a plucking out. Who gave, verse 4, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Here it is. According to the will of God and our Father. Was it God's will that Christ would die for our sins? That he would give himself for our sins? So it was his will that he would give himself for our sins so that he might deliver so that he might deliver out of this present evil world those who trust in him, those who believe the gospel. What is the will of God in this verse? It's that all men be delivered from this present evil world. Write it down. I already made reference to it. Write down 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3-4, through 4, where it says, and I just told you not to go there, now I'm drawing a blank. I hate that. I think that's the first sign I'm getting old. Can't remember stuff. Yeah, no, no comments from the peanut gallery. Okay, verse 3. For this is good, watch, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It is the will of God, it is good and acceptable unto God that all men be what? Saved. He died on the cross for all sin. Nothing was left undone. And when, you by, and when you by faith get into the Lord Jesus Christ, He forgives you of all of your sin, past, present, and future, and you experience total forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the express purpose and will of God is that all men be saved. It is salvation that pulls men out of the present evil world. Go to Colossians. Chapter 1, just revisiting a couple things in conclusion. Who hath delivered us, verse 13, who hath delivered us. Now, when he says us, he's talking about believers. He's talking to and about people who are what? Saved. He's talking about saints. He's talking to people who are in Christ. He's talking about believers. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the present evil world. If you're not in Christ, you're not delivered from the world, I'm sorry to say. You're still dead in your sins. You're still Ephesians 2.1. But if you've been delivered, notice again the past tense, who hath delivered us. Is Paul including himself in with those who have been delivered? He's talking to believers who have delivered us from the power of darkness. And hath, past tense, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption. Do you see you have redemption because you've been delivered? You needed a deliverer, you needed a redeemer. You needed the guy who was going to come and pluck you up and uproot you and redeem you and put you into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood. You better have the phrase through his blood in your Bible in that verse. Because if you don't, you are missing the mechanism by which you're delivered and redeemed. And don't tell me, well, it's in Ephesians, so it doesn't matter if it's not in Colossians. No, because the Colossians had that epistle sent to them, and did they need to know that it was through his blood? Okay? In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Notice, you have deliverance, translation, Redemption and forgiveness. 
You have deliverance. Verse 13, who have delivered us from the power of darkness. There's deliverance. And that translated us. There's translation. In whom we have redemption. There's redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In those two verses, you have deliverance, translation, redemption, and forgiveness. See, God has truly saved us. He has truly delivered us. He has truly redeemed us. He has truly forgiven us on the basis of the cross work and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm almost done. Folks, I, I stand up here and I teach this stuff. And I don't, know, I don't know how this hits you. But this hits me in my spirit, in my inner man, as like the greatest thing in the world that you could possibly ever tell anybody. Okay? It is. And you look around and you say, why don't more people want to hear this? You ever wonder that? How many of you have been to church your whole life and never heard what I'm telling you right now? Not because I'm so great. I'm just telling you what the verses say. But the reason you've never heard it is because you've never had, you never were at a church where somebody actually opened the Bible and expounded the Word of God because they were off doing all this other dumb stuff. Sorry. I know I shouldn't say stuff like that. Somebody's going to write me and say that was rude. But religion gets you on the wheel of performance to try to make God happy with you. And what we're saying here is, no, no, no. The Lord Jesus Christ entered time and history for the sole purpose of dying on the cross for sin. So that he could deliver you, redeem you, translate you, and forgive you. Okay? Why are there not more people that want that? Why are there not more people that see that? Because of this verse right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Has he attacked the truth through false doctrine and false teaching and false religion to obscure the basic fundamental components of the gospel. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Folks, the hope of this world, the hope of this present evil world is not in politics. It's not in a religious system. It's not in any other system of this world that's already controlled by the adversary. The only hope that this world has of getting any better is to get people saved and get the light of the truth in them. That's the, that's the only thing. That's the only remedy there is for the present evil world. And Paul tells us to not, now that we're saved, now that we've been put in that great, that good field over yonder, now he says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of what? Even though you've been, tra- even though you've been put in that field over there, do you still have the thought patterns and thinking of that old world system ingrained into you in your earth suit until the day of redemption? And is it easy to go back and keep and and just walk in that? But he says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of what? Your mind. Listen, none of these, all of men's answers short of the gospel are inadequate. They're inadequate. Because the power of God unto salvation is in the preaching of the cross. Paul says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. You understand that azalea there hears what I'm saying? Most azaleas hear what I'm saying. They're like, that's so stupid. You're telling me that some first century Jew in Bronze Age Palestine that was tortured to death by some Romans is going to save me from my sin? You're crazy. Isn't that the way the world responds? But the way God says and responds is, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is what? The power of God. 
The power of God is in the preaching of the cross. You want to change your family? You want to change your job? You want to change uh, the, the culture and the society? Preach the cross. That's it. Nothing else has a prayer. And the only thing that has, you know, if you look through the history of the dispensation of grace and you look at there's these, these times where, you know, things maybe got a little bit better, I guarantee you that somewhere in those moments of cultural, political recovery is the, is the gospel. It will be there. Luther set the world on fire by recovering the simple understanding of justification by grace through faith, and he changed the world. Okay? We have the message. We have the means. We have the opportunity. Don't let the world system distract you into thinking that all the substitutes are the answer. The answer is Christ. It always has been and it always will be. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We're grateful for your, for your word for the simplicity of the gospel. I am glad that you took, that, that you went to the cross and died for the sin of this azalea. And that when I believed exclusively what you did for me, you rooted me out, you delivered me, you translated me, you redeemed me, and you forgave me. What a wonderful picture and understanding that is. We're grateful this morning for all that you've done for us through Christ.